these were my disclosures. So I've been asked by Dr. Goldhaber and Dr. Piazza to provide an update on antiplatelet therapy in 10 minutes, so I'm going to have to move pretty quickly. There's been a lot that's happened. So let me just say there are lots of antiplatelet uh, receptors and agents that antagonize them, and uh, it seems to be important clinically. I'm going to go back in time a little bit, even though I was asked to provide a an update, and, and uh, go back in time to 1996 in the Capri study. Uh, this was a study of clopidogrel versus aspirin for secondary prevention that showed a significant benefit for clopidogrel over aspirin in patients with recent ischemic stroke, recent MI, or symptomatic PAD, and the clopidogrel lab labeling reflects this. I mention it because in the past few months, clopidogrel has gone generic, and even though the 8.7 percent relative risk reduction seen here might not have excited too many people at the time, I, I think now that it is available as a generic clopidogrel, and its role in secondary prevention instead of aspirin will and should be reconsidered. In particular, some of the higher risk subgroups within the secondary prevention universe, such as patients with prior ischemic events, seem to have particular benefit from clopidogrel monotherapy versus aspirin monotherapy. So I think that uh, we may see a resurgence of clopidogrel uh, instead of aspirin in secondary prevention. Of course, much of the fields moved on to dual antiplatelet therapy. This was examined with clopidogrel plus aspirin, the CHARISMA trial. As you know, the overall trial of secondary plus primary prevention uh, was not positive. That is, uh, clopidogrel plus aspirin wasn't superior to aspirin. Though in the large and pre-specified subgroup of patients with established atherosclerosis, there did seem to be a benefit, uh, albeit in a subgroup. In post hoc analysis, it appeared that the folks that had a previous MI ischemic stroke or symptomatic PAD in particular had a larger benefit from clopidogrel versus placebo on top of aspirin, but post hoc and likewise specifically the prior MI subgroup from Charisma had a large benefit over the course of almost three years of follow-up. That's all post hoc, though. Uh, th though it did seem like there was something really there, and a recent trial, uh, the TRA2P Timmy 50 study, I think has confirmed that concept, uh, albeit prospectively. And that was a large trial of patients with secondary prevention indications for antiplatelet therapy randomized to placebo or vorapaxar, a novel. PAR1 receptor antagonist, another way of antagonizing the platelet. And the overall trial was positive, as shown here, uh, and uh, perhaps even of greater interest, the MI-specific cohort that uh, Ben Sirica recently presented at the European Society of Cardiology uh, looked really good, where there was a, a large uh, absolute and uh, large relative as well reductions in ischemic events in patients who were randomized to vorapaxar versus placebo. Of course, we have to see how the FDA weighs all these data, but regardless of the uh, ultimate clinical role of vorapaxar, the concept that patients with prior ischemic events, in particular prior MI, benefit from being on more than just standard antiplatelet therapy has been established. And of note, the individual components of the composite endpoint all went in the right direction, favoring vorapaxar, including an interesting trend towards a reduction in stroke in this MI population with the use of vorapaxar versus placebo. However, not all the data supporting longer-term intensification of antiplatelet therapy has been positive. There have been three different studies. I show one in the stenting world uh, that have not shown a benefit of longer durations of dual antiplatelet therapy for stents. So now I'm not speaking specifically about MI or acute coronary syndromes, but stenting uh, specifically. And there, uh, in patients who were randomized to six months of dual antiplatelet therapy versus 24 months, no detectable difference in their rate of ischemic events. Uh, however, in terms of bleeding, and this is one particular definition of bleeding here, the Bleeding Academic Research Consortium, or BARC bleeding, there was a doubling of BARC bleeding in those getting two years versus six months of dual antiplatelet therapy. So uh, it's not clear that patients that get a stent should just be on antiplatelet, dual antiplatelet therapy forever. Obviously, they should be on aspirin, but do they need to be on more? Uh, not firmly established. Uh, though there are several trials ongoing to examine that. 
And I think part of what makes it a really challenging question to answer is the shift from first generation to second generation drug eluding stents. Uh, the drug eluding stents uh, have a much better uh, uh, efficacy profile with significant reductions in the need for repeat procedures with the drug eluding stents, the second generation even more so than the first generation. But interestingly, some signals as well of a lower rate of stent thrombosis with the second generation versus first generation drug eluding stents. And even some work uh, starting to emerge that the second generation drug eluding stents might have a lower rate of stent thrombosis than bare metal stents, which if true and confirmed would be a real paradigm shift in cardiovascular medicine. Let me move on now to Prasugra a novel antiplatelet agent, although now it's been around for a little while. It's essentially a more potent version of clopidogrel. The Triton Timmy 38 study showed that prasugrel was superior to clopidogrel over the course of 15 months in ACS patients undergoing PCI, uh, large relative and absolute risk reductions favoring the more potent agent. Uh, this reduction in ischemic events uh, was also paralleled by a large and significant reduction in stent thrombosis over the course of that 15 month of follow up. A lot of that benefit was early on, but there was still benefit even uh, in the uh, later phases of follow up. The downside to the intensification of antiplatelet therapy was more bleeding. Uh, this included an increase in fatal bleeding, and the number of fatal bleeds was pretty small, but uh, still a significant differential in favor of clopidogrel against prasugrel. And, and this really leads to the dilemma in antiplatelet therapy. To date, all uh, attempts at intensification of antiplatelet therapy uh, in the right populations seem to reduce ischemic events, uh, but in all populations seem to increase bleeding. And it is a bit like navigating between Scylla and Charybdis, trying to find the right drug for the right population at the right dose. Trilogy ACS, which was just presented at ESC, was an attempt to try to refine the um, management of ACS patients who were medically managed, who were randomized to either prasugrel or clopidogrel. There was a dosage modification of prasugrel to use a lower dose, 5 milligrams, for patients who were greater than age 75 or who were underweight, an attempt to personalize antiplatelet therapy, not based on genotype or, or platelet function testing, but just plain old phenotype. So a very uh, important uh, way of tackling uh, a clinical trial. However, the overall trial was negative. Uh, that is, there was no benefit for prasugrel versus clopidogrel. Directionally, the event rates were lower in prasugrel uh, over the course of this three-year trial, but um, that wasn't a significant difference. And uh, in a pre-specified analysis, the uh, Trilogy Steering Committee had examined whether there was a benefit before 12 months from randomization, which there clearly was not for prasugrel versus clopidogrel, and after 12 months, where there did appear to be a benefit both in terms of the graphical uh, representation of data and perhaps even the interaction p-value, depending on what you define as positive for interaction p-value. So maybe something going on here. Difficult to say, though, hard to understand biologically why that would happen. And I think there uh, will be further important insights coming from Trilogy in the, in the uh, ensuing months, uh, such as the invasive Trilogy uh, analysis that uh, Dr. Steve Wiviet's leading. So let me move on now to Ticagrelor, which is another oral antiplatelet agent. It's sort of like clopidogrel, except it's not. It's a reversible agent, unlike clopidogrel or prasugrel or even aspirin. It's essentially more efficiently absorbed. Uh, uh, it doesn't require in vivo biotransformation and, and therefore uh, may have some potential benefits or disadvantages due to those characteristics. The PLATO trial examined ticagrelor versus clopidogrel in an all-comer ACS trial and found a significant reduction in ischemic events favoring ticagrelor over clopidogrel over the course of a month. Uh, there was a reduction in myocardial infarction, as other trials of antiplatelets have shown with more potent therapy. Uh, but interestingly, also a reduction in cardiovascular death. About one patient out of 100 treated for a year, less likely to have a cardiovascular death, or for that matter, less likely to die of any cause, uh, had they been randomized to ticagrelor versus clopidogrel. So uh, a bit different from other trials in this space, a reduction not just in overall ischemic events and stent thrombosis and things like that, but also mortality. Similar, though, to those other trials, the more potent agent 
ticagloherin gold does cause more bleeding uh, by any variety of definitions, but that bleeding in the surgical arena doesn't seem to be increased. That is, in patients undergoing bypass surgery, it seems that this reversible agent uh, doesn't have more bleeding despite being more potent than clopidogrel. So the reversible nature might have some benefits around the time of surgical procedures, cabbage or theoretically even other surgical procedures, uh, though that needs to be prospectively validated. Perhaps the the one sort of hole in the uh, Plato story is this uh, observation that in one of the many subgroups examined in Plato, uh, there was uh, a divergence from the overall results. That is, in the North American and in the U.S.-specific cohort, uh, there the data actually went the opposite of the overall trial, such that the Ticagrelor patients had a higher rate of ischemic events. This wasn't statistically significantly different, um, though, depending exactly on how you slice the data and in interaction term that was positive. So, now, maybe there is something specifically going on in the U.S. cohort, or maybe this is just one of many subgroups examined where the data went in a different way. I happen to believe the latter. Uh, the trial that's ongoing right now uh, regarding Ticagalor is a Pegasus trial uh, being done by the Timmy Group, uh, led by Mark Sabatine. And this is a trial that takes patients with prior MI, additional atherothrombotic risk factors, and then randomizes them, in addition to receiving aspirin and other evidence-based therapies, to placebo, or two different doses of Ticagalor, the ACS-approved dose of Ticagalor, or sort of a medium dose of Ticagalor that's a bit more potent than, say, uh, just standard clopidogrel dosing. And the patients will be followed long term for the typical sort of uh, ischemic and safety endpoints. So this will see whether uh, the addition of a more potent antiplatelet on top of aspirin really is indicated for a broad secondary prevention population. We certainly have signals uh, that that is the right thing to do from subgroups from Charisma, uh, from the uh, TIMI-50 trial with Vorapaxar, but uh, you know whether that's a really good strategy with an acceptable trade-off with bleeding will be established in this study. The final agent I'll mention isn't an oral agent, all those other uh, drugs are. This is Cangrelor, which is an intravenous ADP receptor antagonist. It has a very short half-life. It's an ATP analog. Uh, it's out of a patient's system in about an hour after drug cessation. There's an ongoing trial that's examining Cangrelor versus placebo in 11,000 patients undergoing PCI, Champion Phoenix. And hopefully the results of that will be available in the next year or so. To summarize, then, a few points that I want to leave you with. Clopidogrel monotherapy looks appealing in a generic world. Uh, and, of course, uh, multiple generics will be available soon, which will drop the price even more. Dual antiplatelet therapy seems to be indicated for at least a year after acute coronary syndromes and or PCI. A number of randomized clinical trials support that. But there's a potential benefit beyond a year in patients with ACS, whether it's STEMI or non-ST elevation MI. The Charisma subgroup suggests that. Triton, with its 15-month duration, indirectly suggests that. Uh, TIMI-50 TRA2P also suggests that. And Pegasus TIMI-54 will hopefully nail down that concept. Uh, there's no clear benefit, however, in stents for dual antiplatelet therapy beyond 12 months, though there are a number of trials examining longer durations and, in fact, a number of trials examining shorter durations, as short as three months. And finally, it does appear that all these novel agents do reduce ischemic events when the right population is targeted, but they also do increase bleeding, and therefore I think the role and judgment of the clinician will always be central in choosing antiplatelet therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. You did pack a lot of information into a short period of time. Uh, what should we do about testing for platelet function when we're taking care of patients with acute coronary syndrome? And you mentioned genetic testing in passing. It's available. Should we be using it? You know, those are both controversial questions. I'll, I'll keep my answer short just for the sake of time. As far as platelet function testing, there are going to be some data from the Trilogy trial presented at AHA as a late breaker. That'll be the largest prospective trial of platelet function testing. So I should say, let's wait till the results of that and see if platelet function testing, when done prospectively, does or doesn't help guide antiplatelet therapy. Any hunches? 
Um, well, it wouldn't be fair for me to say I'm on the steering committee, so I've seen the data. But um, the only caveat, though, in interpreting those data is it's from an overall negative trial, so I have to view it with a grain of salt. Uh, from the data that exists, though, I think we need to be cautious. Uh, even though in populations of patients there's no question that having heightened platelet activity and reactivity is bad, it's not clear that on an individual basis the predictive power is good enough to guide therapy. As far as genetics, likewise, there are a lot of intriguing data sets and analysis analyses out there. You know, I think there are certain genotypes, if you have them, it's not a good thing to, um, uh, to be on clopidogrel. But having said that, no one's yet proved in a prospective manner that that knowledge should guide therapy. So for the time being, for the average clinician out there taking care of uh, typical patients, I'd say no need to test either other than in research purposes. There might be specific circumstances, patients with recurrent ischemic events, recurrent stent thromboses, maybe there might be a role for that sort of testing. Questions, Dr. Finicos. Uh, Dr. Bott, first of all, thank you so much for spending your Saturday morning with us. I'm sure there are other things to do. My question surrounds the Trilogy ACS trial and the dose adjustment. So you mentioned the tailoring of therapy. Um, can you shed some light on the patients that were over the age of 75 that had a reduced dose? And is there a role for that regimen in our elderly patients? You know, that's really a great question. Uh, and again, a tough one to answer. And I'll tell you within the steering committee, there was uh, sort of a divergence of opinion on how to interpret those results. And there will eventually be a, a dedicated uh, manuscript. But uh, it, it depends. Some members of the steering committee thought that it was a validation of what the FDA had done, because as you know, a five milligram dose is available and that it proves the safety of the dose. And as was presented in the appendices to the New England Journal paper, it does appear to be safe in terms of at least fatal or intracranial really bad bleeding. Um, a critic or a skeptic, though, could counter and say, yes, yeah, safe, but if it wasn't effective in the overall trial, that is, if the overall trial is not positive, what value is safety? So uh, I, I think, uh, you know, in a patient who is at high bleeding risk, clopidogrel 75 remains the standard appears efficacious, it's safe, relatively speaking, and is now cheap. Uh, but in a theoretical world, if price weren't an issue, then five of Prazigal seems to be similar in efficacy and doesn't seem to carry a huge safety penalty, and one could use it. But price is an issue in real life. Deepak, thank you very much. Yes, thank you.